Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a very great privilege and honor to be back here in the Gulbenkian Foundation. And uh, for such a worthy cause as this uh, very special program. Uh, my talk is about the libraries of tomorrow. And uh, what they stand for is embracing the challenge and inventing the future. And uh, I don't know if you prefer to we can darken a little bit the lights so that the slides uh, show up better because I'm going to take you on, yes, that's much better. I'm going to take you on a very quick journey with a lot of pictures to accompany us. So as we would say, tighten, fasten your seat belts and we're gonna go over all of this. A little prologue, something about our changing world and uh, if people think that we have seen something about what the internet is doing, well, as they say in America, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, so the coming internet explosion, something about big data, and how the very structure of knowledge is changing, the revolution itself, and the implication for libraries. And then we'll get to the library of the future, but specifically, perhaps more so than other things, that the, the librarians really do more than, than uh, manage libraries. They defend values. They defend values, and I think that is something that is particularly important for us to talk about. So, as a prologue, my credo is all information to all people at all times. Very useful thing to do, and for the first time, we have the technology to do it. I love books, and I love libraries, and as the president said, I also go with uh, Borges. I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library, and I imagine myself sitting in a room like that after I leave this earthly uh, state. Uh, but I also recognize and admire the new technology, and I'm very involved with many committees globally about this new technology. For the digital revolution we are living through right now is really unprecedented. And I think the future can be great. It is not to be feared because we can, in fact, for the first time, provide all information to all people at all times. But what I want to emphasize is not just the availability of knowledge, it's the way we interact with the structure of knowledge itself from an epistemological and philosophical point of view that is changing. And I think, without exaggeration, this is the most profound revolution since the invention of writing. So, knowledge is really more than information. If you have data, you organize it, it becomes information, and you explain and understand it, that becomes knowledge. But we need more. We really need wisdom. And wisdom will not come simply by accumulation of knowledge. The natural sciences produce a great deal of knowledge, but we need the insight of the social sciences and the wisdom of the humanities to be combined in a pluridisciplinary fashion. So wisdom is really knowledge plus values, the values of how to use that knowledge and how to interact with others. So shorthand, it's libraries and librarians, the two together. And the librarian teacher position you have created is an example of what is needed. So our changing world, I think we are in the age of connectivity. There's been nothing that has been as transformative of the world as the internet. These are the two guys who invented the internet, both friends of mine. That's Vint Cerf and Bob Kane, who invented the TCP IP, which is still the, the backbone of the internet to this day. And Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, WWW, that we all know so well. Louis Poussin did the packet switching. Mark Andreessen designed the first browser. And of course, Bill Gates, whom you all know. But in the browser wars, Netscape of Andreessen was overtaken by Microsoft Explorer. And Steve Jobs got us all to listen to digital music and invented the new business models and of course, all the Apple products. Another young man, Pierre Amidiard, did eBay, and Amazon was Jeff Bezos. And this handful of people really transformed the world, 
And with the arrival of these two, who are Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who invented Google, we have pretty much the landscape that we had before. All the giants are known, and the search engines, Google is by, large, by, by a long way the, the most important one. I must salute Bill Gates, as you see me, I was with him here when he was declaring the creation of his foundation. He has become by far the world's largest philanthropist, and I think that's a very commendable aspect of it. Now, the internet revolution has seen explosive growth. It has transcended political boundaries. It allows us to be connected at the speed of light anywhere in the world. And the result of all of that has also been a profound economic transformation. These are the top 10 companies in 2016. Five of them are internet companies. Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. And the internet itself has become anything and everything and an enormous amount of information, but of very variable quality. And the web itself gets transformed, and we're going towards something called the semantic web, where ideas and knowledge would be connected rather than otherwise. And social connectivity, of course, is growing very fast. To figure out just how fast the first social connectivity was in 2002, uh, Friendster, then MySpace in 2003, Facebook in 2004. And uh, Facebook had a billion people connected in less than 10 years, which is a level of penetration that we haven't seen in many other technologies. YouTube was 2005, and the first smartphone, the iPhone, was 2007. So it's not even 10 years old yet. So what you have in this connected world is a living, vibrant, changing, interconnected knowledge base firing away. It's like imagining the neurons of a brain that covers the whole planet, which is firing away at all times. Now, lots more have come since the few I've mentioned, and lots more to come. But really, what we are witnessing that is transforming everything we do is the marriage of the internet and the mobile phone. A whole new generation, ladies and gentlemen, a whole new generation is coming up. The kinds of things that we knew ourselves, who can, my grandchildren cannot imagine not a day before the internet, and when I told them that when I grew up in Egypt, we didn't even have television. <sighs> not even old-fashioned television. I said, yeah, not even. We had radio. We had radio. <laughs> so when I, was, when I was a child. So, But this is now ubiquitous. And uh, how ubiquitous it is, I like these pictures, just capture uh, how people are connecting with each other. Here they are in the Rijksmuseum. That is... <laughs> Rembrandt's great, I'm an optimist. So I say, oh, they were so moved by the painting that they're writing to their friends how wonderful it is. <laughs> but, but I just say that to convince myself. Actually, we have to find ways to make this interesting into their hands. That's what it's all about. But sometimes it's dangerous. There's girlfriend, boyfriend, watching a game going to the beach, at another museum, going out to the restaurant, having coffee. I mean, not talking, they're texting to each other. That's in the metro in Tokyo, that's dates. Here they are in college, texting, reading, texting, sharing. Um, <clears throat> it does cause a little bit <laughs> of intergenerational <laughs> communication problems sometimes as I'm sure many of you have. But for us, this is a challenge that we have to overcome. Now, the second big challenge, just to explain how big it is, is big data. Big data is about the revolution that is beginning now. It started with uh, particle physics from CERN, for example, 700 uh, uh, petabytes coming out of a single experiment. Uh, the radio astronomy, the kilometer square array in South Africa and Australia, produces an exabyte of information a day. That's still quite small. So how about what does that mean? We, how do we handle these enormous amounts of information? Well, it's already being done. This, while it may look very solid, is what we refer to as the cloud. Uh, it is really arrays of computers in remote areas. 
And Amazon has been gathering data, for example, on each and every one of us. So here I am, Ismail Sragedin, I'm looking at the collection of poems. And immediately they tell me, customers who bought this item also bought such and such. So just as I am clicking, they're analyzing my profile, they're digging into their, their databases, combining the two, analyzing it, coming up instantaneously with a recommendation. Reflect for a moment. We go to a library, we ask the librarian for a book, they say there's the catalog, go and look into the catalog, you go and look into the catalog, look what's happening already in the commercial sector and the speed with which this is being handled for that new generation. And Amazon has been doing this, and they're not the only ones, Google, Microsoft, everybody else is doing it. We already know that the analysis is being done. The National Secu the Agency of the United States uh, has uh, been listening to everybody's telephone calls, as we now know, and they're able to sift through billions of phone calls. This is their operation center in Washington, and uh, that's the building. That's the National Science, uh, the National Security Agency. And of course, after they were caught, they said, oh, sorry, mea culpa, we're not gonna do this again. However, they are already expanding and doubling the size of the building. So, no comment about what you expect of that. But the private sector is doing a lot of that too. Now, I talked about an exabyte, and I'll come back to that. In 2007, the University of Southern California did an analysis and the entire record of humanity, the entire available record of humanity from the past, from the earliest cave drawings to the latest records was 256 exabytes. How big is that? Well, first of all, that was in 2007, and we are increasing that much more. But what's an exabyte? Well, I can tell you it's a billion, billion bytes, which looks like that with all these zeros, but that's not very helpful. So let me tell you what it is. If all the text in the Library of Congress was digitized, all the text was digitized, one exabyte would be more than 100,000 times all the text in the Library of Congress. And we're adding that, more than that today, every day. So you can imagine the scale of the data that is being there. That age of big data is already here. Now we're not talking only about exabytes, we're talking about zettabytes. And a zettabyte is a thousand exabytes. That's the explosion of knowledge that we have and that we, not only we as librarians, we as people concerned with culture have to deal with that explosion of knowledge because more change will come. This is a committee on which Vince Cerf and I were, were, were serving, which we are discussing the future of the internet. There are abscess, uh, aspects of technical obsolescence and physical obsolescence. And we will look for a new form of analysis to deal with this amount of information. So we will have that uh, analysis that goes descriptive and diagnostic and predictive and prescriptive. And that will require both hindsight and insight and foresight. But we will do that with new machines and new ways of thinking. And uh, we can think of also doing something that we couldn't do before because of all of this. For example, understanding our history through time. So, for example, historical turning points and changes in language. Well, the historical turning point in question, it was said by McPherson, the great historian of the Civil War, that before the Civil War in America, they referred to the United States are, in plural, the states are. And then after the Civil War, it became the United States is, so the unitary state. Well, uh, we can now actually map the number of appearances of print in billions and billions of words and see this is the actual Civil War period. This is going from 1776 to 2000. And this is where the word is, the United States is appears, and the United States are. So in a sense, you can say he's right. But in another sense, he really isn't because the Civil War was not exactly the transformative point. There was a transformation that just went on and took place afterwards. So this richer insight comes from that new analysis. Our language, how does our language change? 
Well, if you look at irregular verbs, like burnt, who now gets written burned, we can actually find when the crossovers occurred and when one was abandoned for the other and how. So it gives us new insight into our cultural history as well. We can look at technology, how it, it acted. So this is reference, the red here is references to railroads, then references to radio, the green is television, and that is the internet, which shows how quickly it is going in terms of the number of technologies. So we can do a lot of things. I don't know what we can do, but we are on the cusp of something very profound, and that is still very little compared to the coming internet explosion. We expect global traffic to reach over one zettabyte, which is more than a thousand exabytes, this year. By the end of this year, we will have more than a zettabyte. We will have added to the internet more than one zettabyte, 1.1 to be precise. And by 2020, we will be adding at the rate of 2.3 zettabytes per year. And uh, just to give you an idea, in 92, when we started looking at this, global traffic was 100 gigabytes per day. 10 years later, it was 100 gigabytes per second, per second. Uh, for a day to the second, and then now we are 20 gigabytes, and we expect 60 gigabytes by 2020. 2020 is like the day after tomorrow. I mean, it's not very far. And global IP traffic will increase threefold over the next five years. Smartphones, which are the key, will exceed PC traffic. There will be much more connectivity through telephones than through computers. And this is a very scary graph. It doesn't tell you much until you realize Okay, this is the fastest growth rate, compound annual growth rates will be for smartphones, we know that. But what is M2M? Anybody know? Machine to machine. No humans. It's machines talking to each other. That will be the Internet of Things. Many other new capabilities are going to emerge out of that. And the number of devices connected to IP networks will be more than three times the global population. More than three times the global population will be the number of devices, and mobiles will be the key to that, and the traffic between now and 2020 will increase eightfold, almost ten times. So our personalized phones will become key to everything. All devices will be interconnected. Wi-Fi, wireless connectivity will be the key, and what is more, video will take over in place of text in many things, you already probably get people who send you links to videos on YouTube to watch rather than getting links to articles and uh, books to read. Uh, and we get a million minutes of video content will cross the network every second. And video will be 82%, over 80% of all IP traffic. Now that tells us something about visual versus written transformations. And where will the fastest growth be? Actually, the fastest growth will be in my part of the world, the Middle East and Africa. But along with that, there is a more profound transformation of the way we handle knowledge and the way we deal with knowledge. Now, I've broken it into seven pillars, as I call them, but really they are intertwined. They're, they're not, uh, I just separate them for clarity of discussion rather than otherwise. The first of these is parsing and life, and how we organize knowledge. Now, we've always organized knowledge by finished products, either books or essays. Uh, that can be, each one stands on its own, we know who the author is, and it's like building a beautiful structure with bricks, where every brick comes next to the other. Uh, the first step was that these bricks were then digitized like in the Public Library of Science, the articles, instead of being printed, are now digitized, and they are born digital and don't get printed unless you, you download them. But the real question is different. The books are what I would call dead, dead in the following sense. If you and I have the same book, and uh, from the same edition, and I say you open page 137, and I will open page 137, 
and the first line will be the same with you and with me, and 10 years later we can re reopen again and they will still be the same. It doesn't change. But if I tell you, go look at such and such a thing at this website, by the time you open the website, it could have already changed. You have a constantly living document that is being constantly amended in the new website structure, which has become the new parsing for knowledge. And the hypertext that connects from one to the other, which we know. So the web is becoming the new way where information is stored, where information is found, where information is retrieved. But in the very structure, it is a living, changing structure, not like the structure that we have built over the millennia, not the centuries, the millennia built with great books. Now, the other problem, of course, is the organization of knowledge. We still have conventional organization of knowledge. This is the Dewey Decimal classification, most common for many librarians. But that's very different. This is a mapping that was done by the New York Times about what current knowledge looks like. And as you can see, the interconnections are very different from these kind of very clear, rigid classifications, which incidentally are close to the departments in universities where people study that. But we can think of different ways of doing that. We can actually look at the links as they are on the internet by people who are studying and using these uh, sciences and disciplines who uses what more and how they are connected is an important part of that. We can do that for the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the like. And beyond that, we've now gone already into what we call augmented reality. We all know that from Google Maps and other things of that nature. And providing information when and where it is needed. In this case, a doctor at an accident site can actually get information about the patient. And as I said before, we're back to this living, vibrant, changing, interconnected knowledge base. The second pillar is really about image and text. Our human brain has evolved to be much more powerful in its visual than in its textual analysis. So I expect more image and text. So for example, it's much easier to look at the picture of these pine cones than to read the description of what a pine cone looks like. There are many positives to that. For example, Imagine you open a door for one second and close it again. Just one second. You will be able to tell whether the room was filled with people or empty, whether it had windows or it didn't, the color of the walls, the type of furniture. All of that you will analyze instantaneously. You will tell whether the people are an informal gathering or a very formal gathering. You can tell whether it's equipment or not. Your I captures that in a fraction of a second, and your brain is capable of actually explaining what you saw from that fraction of a second. So I expect that a lot of the new material that they will be evolving with this huge explosion of information will actually realize and depend more on the visual. Already 3D visuals for medical purposes, analysis that goes down to the level of the the DNA, or that goes beyond the visual spectrum, like heat analysis here, which is also used for humans in tomography, and visual analysis that can't be explained any other way. This happens to be the map of the Tokyo uh, subway, but I could give you just as well the New York subway, and I defy anybody to describe it in text. <laughs> you can't, you need, you need to have that diagram to be able to follow what's going on. And I have not been in space, but I vicariously enjoy being with the astronauts from the pictures that they take, or different ways of looking at our cities, etc. So there are some negatives, however, because text is a triple abstraction. The letter, then the word, and then the sentence. And it's a joint effort as I read, I construct the images in my mind along with the author, so the text is really a joint effort and we're losing some of that and we're losing it quickly. Third pillar is humans and machines. And to put it bluntly, with the exception of pure mathematics and some questions in philosophy like uh, what is the, the meaning of life and what is the purpose of the universe, in every other field of knowledge, every other field of knowledge, humans will need machines 
to access, retrieve, manipulate, and add to the body of knowledge. I mean, the idea of an Einstein or a Newton writing by themselves is no longer true. And that this expansion of our brain's reach through machines is going to be wonderful in some levels, and it raises questions about artificial intelligence on the other. We all know that Deep Blue defeated Garry Kasparov 20 years ago. That already is 20 years ago when the top chess champion was defeated. But we are processing ever more powerful computers. To the moment right now, the human brain is still about a million times more powerful than the most powerful computer we have. But at the rate we're going, that will be reversed and computers will be a million times more powerful than a human being.